Yes. Good afternoon and welcome to the Knowledge and Learning Commons. My name is Roberta Ciampo and I'm the moderator of this episode of The Histories, a series of online events at the UN Library and Archives where we dive into the histories of multilateralism through the archives of the League of Nations and we highlight some of the stories and personalities in our history. The histories of this episode marks a hundred years since the establishment of the International Committee on International Cooperation. In 1922, on the shores of Lake Geneva, international personalities from the sciences and the arts met for the first time. The idea was to create a coordinating body for cultural matters that would promote intellectual cooperation as the hallmark for international peace. The work of the committee and its executive branch, the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation, paved the way to the creation of UNESCO after the Second World War. The Easteris episode intends to explore the nature and the legacy of the League's work in the field of intellectual cooperation, but also shed light on the research findings and the wealth of archival resources. In the historical collections managed by the UN Library and Archives Geneva, we have the privilege to have the archives of the League of Nations Intellectual Cooperation and the International Bureau section from 1919 to 1946. The subfonds consist of 314 boxes that contain more than 7,700 documents. All the documents have been digitized thanks to a five years project, LongTUD. And now are they are freely available to the UN Archives Geneva platform. Hence today, we have the pleasure to have three speakers that are expert in this field. But before I introduce our speakers, let me remind our audience that you can submit your question on Mentimeter. Uh, please head to menti.com or scan the QR code and type in the code you find on the screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. And now, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Kai Li, uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at Media Transformation, Leibniz Institute for Educational, Media George Eckert Institute. Her research focuses on a specific aspect of intellectual cooperation, education. And she offers new perspectives on the histories of educational development in China. Welcome, Dr. Li, and happy to have you here. From University of Lausanne, Dr. Martin Grandjean. He's a junior lecturer in contemporary and digital history. His research focuses on the use of metadata and network analysis in the humanities and social sciences, and he's currently working on the archives of the League of Nations. Welcome, Dr. Grandjean. Happy to have you here. Hello. Thank you. From the Northumbria University, we have Professor Daniel Laka. Associate Professor of European History. In his research work, he has examined transnational movements and associations in the 19th and 20th century. With a focus on the League of Nations work in the field of intellectual cooperation. Welcome, Professor Laka. It's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure being here virtually. Now, Professor Laka, we are here today because the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation was established a hundred years ago. Could you give us an overview of how the multilateral cooperation took form? What were the main steps, the main challenges? Yes, uh, many thanks. I've um, got a small presentation that provides a little bit of an introduction into the uh, different institutional arrangements that we normally describe as intellectual cooperation under the auspices of the League of Nations. 
So I will say a little bit about that and also some of the impulses and concerns that drove that work. Uh, to this end, I will share my screen now. So let me just uh, try to make sure that I can uh, get my PowerPoint up and running. So let's see, I think. Yes, we this... can see your screen. Okay, excellent. That's wonderful. That's the first issue out of the way. So uh, thank you very much, Roberta. And um, as you've said uh, already, uh, one of the reasons why we have this event, I guess, in this particular year is because we're uh, marking the centenary of uh, the League of Nations arrangements and ventures in the field of intellectual cooperation, because in 1922, the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation was established. And I guess this already uh, drives home one important point. Namely, of course, the League of Nations itself was uh, created at the Paris Peace Conference or through the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, uh, really opened its gates uh, in 1920. And uh, in that respect, uh, it's evident that when the League was being constructed, ventures in the field of culture and intellectual exchange weren't part of its original remit. And it was partly also due to efforts from what we would call civil society uh, that this was changed because uh, to many activists from international associations, uh, it was evident that in order to construct a more durable international order, you'd also have to target people's uh, assumptions, ideas, and of course, those were being formed in the fields of culture and education. So there were different groups, one of them, uh, the Union of International Associations, uh, which was an international association based in Belgium that presented these demands, and ultimately they were taken up in the assembly of the League of Nations, and a proposal was created, uh, adopted to create an international committee on intellectual cooperation. This was not a large body. Uh, it was meant to be comprised of eminent personalities, and uh, its 12 members included such uh, prestigious figures as the um, philosopher Henri Bergson, uh, the physicist uh, Albert Einstein, uh, the scientist Marie Curie. So really people who had a, a significant reputation in international, intellectual, and scientific life. In 1926, this committee was complemented by a, a wider body that was set up, partly thanks to the support of the French government, and that was the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation, which opened its, gate, its gates in Paris in 1926, as I said, and uh, which uh, was headed by a Frenchman, Julien Locher, and the subsequent directors were also French. So there's a kind of very strong French influence, influence in this body. But as an international administration, it had officials from a lot of different countries. Uh, so in that sense, it was also uh, reflecting the working patterns of the League of Nations more broadly. The um, arrangements for intellectual cooperation also extended to various other bodies. For instance, in 1926, an international museum's office was created in Paris uh, to co coordinate work in the field of uh, museums and other heritage institutions. In 1928, the Italian government uh, supported the creation of an international uh, institute for educational cinematography. So there was an engagement with new technologies and what they could bring as well. And throughout its lifetimes, these different bodies for intellectual cooperation maintained various expert committees, specialist committees. There were also national committees on intellectual cooperation that were meant to feed into the work uh, of these international bodies. So there was a real attempt to link up the national and the international. And taken together, these different ventures are what we describe as the League's Organization for Intellectual Cooperation. Now, what were the realms of action for this body? Well, uh, as with other parts of the League of Nations bureaucracy, there was a real dedication to uh, compiling information and making it available to uh, both political audiences, officials, and, and others. So uh, throughout its lifetime, these bodies conducted surveys and studies. 
But there were also an attempt to go beyond uh, producing massive heaps of paper because these bodies also sought to coordinate the work of various cultural actors and institutions to, for instance, facilitate cooperation amongst archivists or librarians from different countries. And quite proactively, uh, the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation sponsored various forms of intellectual exchange. So it held meetings, congresses, sometimes on very specific topics, uh, sometimes on wide-ranging questions of international society. And there were, moreover, specific initiatives, uh, for instance, in fields such as textbook reform, the uh, reform of school textbooks. And this tied in with a broader point, namely that two of the protagonists of these ventures, activities in the uh, field of intellectual exchange were meant to facilitate international understanding. Indeed, at one point, uh, these League bodies also launched a project to educate young people in the work of the League of Nations. So there was a real uh, sense that if you wanted to create a more peaceful future, you had to operate in the intellectual realm. Moreover, in these adventures, uh, the League bodies maintained uh, connections to various international associations, protagonists from what we would call nowadays civil society, uh, or what we would call non-governmental organizations as well. So there was a, an attempt to read into the life of uh, different uh, nations through the interaction with such bodies. And then finally, one aspect that has been acknowledged uh, in terms of the uh, ventures associated with intellectual cooperation was the way in which uh, these bodies also facilitated what people called at the time the scientific study of international relations. So nowadays, political scientists, you know, uh, are engaging with, you know, what we call IR, international relations, but some of those first steps towards organizing academic conferences on IR, you know, they, they, they can be traced back to these, these efforts. Now, one aspect that I think is quite important is that, of course, the ambition of these ventures was international. But as historians, of course, we have to be mindful of the manifold uh, limitations of any ventures that were labeled international. And there are two particular aspects in this context that we need to take note of. And the first of them was that, like many other forms of international cooperation in the 1920s and 1930s, it was partly premised on ideas of nationhood. So the nation did continue to matter. And we can see this even when we go into uh, a body such as the uh, International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation. Now, nominally, uh, the individuals in those bodies were meant to be appointed on the basis of their international reputation as great thinkers. And to some extent, that was the case. But of course, for individual countries, it was a highly sensitive matter who would represent them. Uh, on this slide here, you can see Albert Einstein uh, in the middle. And this is quite striking because uh, Germany did not become a member of the League of Nations until 1926, uh, of course, as a, as a legacy of its actions in the First World War and the construction of the post-war order. But Einstein was part of this committee, which, however, caused some, uh, you know, dis, uh, dissent uh, amongst German officials, and more broadly, the question of what to do with Germany and how much to involve Germany in its work was something that was actually controversially discussed within the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation in the first uh, years of its existence. The second aspect about limitations is that in theory, the ambitions of this institute were global, and indeed, uh, in the 1930s, uh, there was a series of publications that were sponsored by uh, the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation, which engaged with questions of civilization or civilizations. So there was an attempt to, for instance, as you can see here on the slide, to facilitate uh, a dialogue on matters of East and West, in inverted commas. Uh, but, of course, this was subject to very clear boundaries. I mean, by and large, this was a body dominated by uh, Europeans, 
even though there were some uh, uh, some protagonists, some members from countries from what we would nowadays call the global south, but to a very limited extent. Uh, you know, there was, was, was one Indian representative at, at one point, and beyond the south, uh, Japan uh, participated, for instance, in those ventures of the international committee as well. But by and large, uh, the uh, international bodies for intellectual cooperation were a reflection of the limitations of this order. Patterns of exclusion that we can see elsewhere in the period are also manifesting themselves in those bodies. And more broadly, we can see also a thinking in terms of civilization, a thinking in terms of boundaries, where, uh, you know, a reflection of perhaps the uh, transmission of ideas, uh, the multiplicity, the heterogeneity of particular societies was not quite being accepted, and we need to be conscious of those limitations. And this takes me to the final point, uh, namely the question of significance and legacies. Now, over the past, certainly the past two decades or so, the work of uh, the League of Nations more generally has uh, become subject to a reassessment amongst historians. So many historians nowadays no longer look at the League of Nations in terms of failures, but they rather try to appreciate what the League did, you know, what its obstacles were, but also to what extent the League pointed towards different possible futures in this open-ended uh, context of the interwar years. Um, but having said that, whilst many bodies of the League of Nations systems uh, you know, have therefore been reappraised, for uh, quite a long time, the bodies for intellectual cooperation were seen as probably one of the really not so successful parts of the League of Nations system. Now, there were attempts to, to challenge that view, but I would say that whereas the broader League system has been subject to reappraisal in the last 20 years, research on uh, the international cooperation, intellectual cooperation ventures has only really been more widely acknowledged uh, in the last 15 years or so. So it was a little bit later that this happened. Um, and my argument would be that one of the reasons for this is that, uh, of course, when you deal with any legacies in the realm of ideas, intellectual exchange, it becomes more difficult to measure them. It's more difficult to actually say, you know, what is the tangible outcome here? But as historians, because intellectual cooperation dealt with such wider questions of national identity, international community, it actually provides a really fertile territory for asking broader historical questions because work in the field of intellectual cooperation in many ways reflected an international order that was in the making, that was being questioned and challenged in various ways. Uh, and in that respect, looking into this body also allows us to get a glimpse of international society and how it operated or did not operate in the 1920s and 30s more broadly. And I'll leave it at that and look forward to hearing from the other two panelists. Thank you, Professor Laka. Fantastic. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure our audience has already formulated questions, but if not, here's a reminder uh, to go on Mentimeter, menti.com, and type in the code you find on the screen. And now let's continue the conversation with Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee, your research focuses on a specific aspect of intellectual cooperation, education. Can you tell us about the importance of education and the role of the youth for the League of Nations? Yes, education and the youth were very important for thinkers for the ICIC and the League of Nations. So since 1920 and even earlier, several proposals on education and inter-university relations from private organizations had already been sent to the League, which was transferred to the ICIC and after it, after it was established in 1922. So during the life of the ICIC, we can observe that the League's educational activities were expanding their focus from higher education and intellectual groups to the mass education and the general public, especially the younger generation. So if we consider education in a broad sense, 
referring to all aspects of all level of formal and informal education, we can say that ICIC took education as one of their main works from the very beginning with the establishment of the subcommittee of inter-university inter relation. So the ICIC decided to, uh, decided to facilitate direct interaction and exchange between universities, particularly in scientific research. For example, promoting exchange students and professors equivalent recognition of academic courses and a degree, and also facilitating the exchange of scientific methods. Such activities not only aimed at reviving the intellectual life, which was violated by the war, but also sought to foster a sense of cooperation and understanding among intellectual groups and, inc and inducing them into a uh, to devote their energies to the common task of securing peace and uh, advancing of uh, civilization. And in addition to the connection the higher educational institutions, the ICIC also tried to motivate the universities to provide courses about other nations to students, so in order to diminish misunderstanding and cultivate sympathy towards others. Similar activities also include uh, teaching international relations, just as Daniel mentioned, and all those events were intended to encourage cooperation, mutual understanding within the scope of higher education for the sake of perceiving peace. But if we consider education in a narrow sense, uh, as many members of the ICIC did in the organization's early years, uh, which means the mass education, the schooling of the younger generation, then the program teaching about League of Nations assigned by Assemble in 1925 was the starting point. So devoting itself to such activities demonstrated an expansion of Fox from the intellectual groups to the general population. So it was gradually formulated to the common sense among League intellectuals that the League's success and continued existence depend on the sympathetic attitudes of the various peoples and not merely intellectual but the public played an important role in maintaining the peace. So it sought to instill in the young of the world a shared belief in cooperation leading to peace and in the League's ability to uphold the peace. And a subcommittee of teaching about League of Nations was constituted. It also published an educational journal, uh, namely the Educational Survey, and later the Bulletin of League of Nations Teaching as a platform for exchange information on how the program was implemented in different countries, as well as the league's work in the field of education and with, and those with, with regards to youth. And in addition, the League of Nations also provided summer schools and summer courses for young people from all the world to learn more about the league and to get to know each other. And also uh, mentioned like the textbook refreshing activities were also very important for the league. Thank you. Well, the Assembly of the League of Nations adopted a resolution on history textbooks. Can you tell us a bit more about this initiative? Can it be considered a pioneering initiative? Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, I think the initiative was a courageous and a challenging undertaking for the ICIC and the League of Nations. So after the end of First World War, nationalism and the militarism in history textbooks became a worry for educators and international intellectuals who believed that such beliefs fostered a misunderstanding and a hatred towards others. And the resolution on textbook revision was first proposed by uh, uh, Julio Gasser, uh, I hope I pronounced correct, a Spanish committee member of the ICIC in 1923 and accepted by the Assembly in 1926. However, there were only three cases pre to 1930. And in 1937, 26 countries signed an intergovernmental agreement on the teaching of the history and that uh, with an emphasis on the world history and emphasis on the interdependence of nations. So uh, as we know, the contents in textbook, particularly history textbook, were and remain a challenging topic. History textbooks are essential for establishing national identity, the shared memories of a nation in which the relationship between oneself and others is the deficit and the taught to future generations. And in addition, education, especially the mass education, was viewed as an integral part of national safari in the interwar period and also in nowadays. 
Also, the methods of uh, manufacturing and selecting textbook vary greatly and differently from country to country. So, a main concern among the member of the ICIC at, uh, during interwar period was that such kind of work might result in accusation of interfering with national safari. The concern was technically solved by the quite practical design machinism. That means the national committees of the ICIC in each country were tasked with uh, carrying out uh, the task of a uh, uh, foreign training base, such as comparing lists of textbooks from their own countries, as well as those from other nations that, in their opinion, need special revision. And the national committee, uh, they would consult it with the ICIC, and the ICIC would uh, forward request from one national committee to another. So the ICIC served as the exchange center and organizer. However, the ICIC did not comment on the substance of particular national textbook and did not meddle the way each national committee carried their works. So the event that in, uh, I think the event that in 1937, that 26 governments signed the intergovernmental intergovernment agreement was more the symbolical uh, milestone than the practical um, practical actions, uh, because uh, as we know, when it when concerning national education, especially mass education, the support of the government is is quite important. And I think the work uh, of textbook revision was continued and promoted by the UNESCO after the end of the Second World War. And the more actual and the progressive had been done in many countries by scholars from the 1950s. So, for example, Georg Eckert, the founder of the institute I'm working now, was an important scholar who promoted the revision of textbook between Germany and the previous during the wartime, the so called enemy countries. And later, he also promoted some European countries and some Asian countries uh, to. Uh, so called the West and the East to re revise textbook within the framework of the UNESCO. And I think, uh, in fact, how to uh, teach about others in educational media and how to promote respect to other countries and cultures and how to settle historical disagreement are still serious challenges for many countries, especially those are still in conflicts. So from my perspective, uh, there are still many research gaps on the study of the League of Nations in the field of uh, um, textbook revision or more broader education, I think which could provide valuable insights for current attempts to promote international understanding and the peace through education. I agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Li. I know you examined, studied the role of Chinese representatives. Can you tell us a bit more about their role for the League of Nations? Uh, yeah. So uh, I think um, so. When the, uh, when the ICIC was first established, there were no Chinese representatives, but uh, the Chinese diplomats, they were eager to find such a position for Chinese uh, representatives because they considered uh, the ICIC represented a kind of uh, co international cultural order, uh, international cultural order, and, uh, as uh, and they thought China as a country with long history uh, should have such a position. So, uh, but it was not so easy to get such a position. And uh, uh, from 1925, since they were adding the uh, correspondence, these kind of actors, and then uh, Hu Shi, a Chinese philo philosopher, was uh, nominated as the Chinese correspondence. But uh, according to my current research, based on the archive materials, I found it uh, seems that. Uh, the ICIC part wanted to connect to Hu Shi, but Hu Shi himself never uh, seemed to receive the invitation because I also looked at his, tried to look at his diaries and didn't find him mention about it at all. Um, but but in, in the 1920s, China was for a long time in a civil war. So it was only after 1927, 28, uh, the establishment of the 19 uh, government, then the China started to seeking such position again. And uh, it was in 1928-1929 that uh, there was a delegate uh, group visited China and uh, wanted to establish the uh, intellectual cooperation with Chinese government. So at that time, it was Wu uh, Pihui, so a very uh, one of the founder of the Kuomintang. Uh, he was invited or got the position to be the committee members. 
And uh, so if I look at how Chinese media at that time reported the events, it was described like uh, this is an invitation from the ICIC, which proves the importance of China and how uh, successful we have in this uh, diplomacy works. However, Wu Zhihui, he himself was uh, not really interested in the work of ICIC. All he had, all he was too busy to go to ICIC conference. So I found different excuses like, oh, I'm sick news, I have no time. And in fact, it was Li Yuying, another very uh, important uh, scholar and also the founder of Kuomintang. He attended the work of the ICIC and later established further cooperation in the field of uh, especially education, like the education uh, missions appointed by League of Nations in 1931 to China and in 1932 uh, with the organization, uh, with the coordinating of the ICIC, that a, a Chinese educational mission went to European countries and visited eight countries to look at different uh, educational uh, situation and uh, came back to China with uh, reports. Very interesting. Thank you for your answers. Uh, I wish we could uh, continue the conversation on these aspects, but I'm sure we'll circle back on this during the Q and A session. And speaking of which, here's another reminder to our um, participants to go on menti.com and type in the code you find on the screen. And now let's continue the conversation with Dr. Martin Grandjean. He, is the, he examined the outcomes of the International Committee on the International Cooperation 2022 Conference and the digitization of the League of Nations. Uh, Dr. Conjant, you are the co-organizer of this conference um, that was held uh, at the UN Library and Archives last May. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this conference and what were the major outcomes? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for, for, uh, for this question. Um, I, I've been working on, on intellectual cooperation for a bit more than a dozen years. And when, when you work on such a subject, you, you read the work of colleagues, but you don't really have the opportunity to meet most of them. You, you, will, you will meet some of them at, at certain specific conferences, but, but lots of these names are, are unknown, uh, uh, despite your, your very good knowledge of the, their papers, books, uh, uh, and different publications. So uh, uh, since a few years, uh, seeing the centenary of uh, 1922 approaching, I was, I was wondering if the research community was interested in such an event or m mature enough uh, uh, to, 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 to gather uh, uh, in such a conference. So, so I reached out to, to the UN archive to discuss the, the, the ID. And um, so, so, so in uh, organizing the conference for the centenary, centenary of the, the Committee on Intellectual Cooperation uh, 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 last May here in, 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 uh, at, at the UN in Geneva, the, the aim was clearly to bring people together. Of course, there is always a scientific aim, and, and, and we always try to, to, to bring new information, new knowledge to, to, to the public. But, but basically, the, the goal was really to, to make people uh, meet each other. And, 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 and this is the main output of this event, that this research community, which has grown a lot in, in, in recent years, takes a moment to meet. Um, and it was a great time, and, and so rewarding for all of us to have an event entirely dedicated to the, to the, sub, to the subject. It was also also a great way to realize that the diversity of, of our approaches, and and and, and Daniel uh, already told us that that uh, uh, we are in a moment where where uh, this diversity is increasing very 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 quick quickly, uh, um, and and um, uh, whether they are global transnational cultural studies or on the contrary analysis around a specific country, a personality, a specific scientific issue like like uh, the one Kai uh, 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 just told us uh, uh, before. Uh, and of course, if you want to see by yourself, you can you can still go to to uh, intellectualcooperation.org to to see the, all the papers of of this conference that are completely free to 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 read. Yes, and as you said, we've seen a rediscovery of the League of Nations in the past twenty years. And why do you think scholars are still interested in the League of Nations? And would you foresee the same trend for the intellectual cooperation? I, 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 I don't want to make the, the, the full historiography of the League of Nations just in, in two minutes here, but because uh, that's a very wide subject and, and, and lots of people are probably uh, are better at that than me. But, but if you, we look specifically at intellectual cooperation, when, when, when we look at the literature on the subject, uh, 
uh, we see that the number of articles published in the last 10 to 15 years um, uh, is as high as all the scientific production around intellectual cooperation for decades. Uh, uh, so, so, so it's really a topic that is, that is getting a lot of attention uh, uh, today. Uh, uh, but, all, but of course, as as the, the historiography of the League of Nations, it has been subject to many waves uh, uh, of historiography, and we are currently at the top of a, of, a, of one of these waves, probably. Uh, uh, if uh, 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 if we analyze this, this this current trend a bit more precisely, we see that. Uh, um, uh, we are not any more focused on a pure institutional analysis. This was the case 20, 30 years ago. We, uh, intellectual cooperation was analyzed as one entity within the League of Nations uh, uh, with a specific body, specific uh, uh, institutes, uh, and specific role within the big uh, international organizations uh, uh, world. Um, now, uh, we're not anymore uh, only studying and, and focusing on what was said in Geneva in the 20s and 30s, but 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 we study the, the the reception of this kind of attempt to coordinate science and culture at the na national level and according to the actors uh, who carried it out. Um, uh, in, in in short, uh, uh, intellectual cooperation has often been summarized as the ancestor of UNESCO or as a place where Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, and Henri Bergson uh, discussed. And, and, and what current research does is to go beyond these cliches and to try to, uh, uh, to, to, to discuss the implications of uh, uh, um, this big gathering of eminent uh, uh, scholars uh, and, 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 and these implications on uh, local contexts, uh, on global cultural uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, and so and so. Thank you for your answer. Well, I know you are interested in the digitization of the League of Nations. Can you tell us why and also what are the methodologies you use and more in general, what about the digital humanities? Of course, uh, um, uh, currently uh, uh, you are, you are uh, uh, um, finishing the digitization of, of the, the, the League of Nations archives and, and that's an extremely uh, uh, in interesting opportunities uh, uh, for all historians working on, on this subject and, of course, uh, on intellectual co cooperation. So, first of all, of, of course, the digitization of archives is, is obviously a fabulous booster for, for historical research uh, uh, because it, it's faster, of course, to, to, to retrieve documents, uh, but also uh, because more people can, can, can get them. Uh, you, you don't necessarily need to, 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 to pay a, a, a plane a travel to, to Geneva to, to, to see these documents and to, to spend time there uh, uh, and, and money and to struggle with all the boxes and things like that. But, but, but digitizing archives is not just making everything faster uh, and, 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 and more accessible. Uh, it's, it doesn't just save us from physically going uh, into the archives. It's a way to ask other questions or in a way that wasn't possible before because now we have the, ma the massive data and, and, and all this information that is here for us to dig in and, and we, can, we can ask a question or look at this very big uh, uh, collection of data uh, uh, in ways that were not possible before, simply because our own uh, brain is is simply not able to, 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 to compute all the information we have in front of us when we, we download all the PDFs that, that uh, the League of Nations archives uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and, and the UN archives put, put on the web uh, uh, these days. Um, so so it's, a, it's, it's not only a bigger uh, um, uh, data set, but it's also another way of analyzing it. In, in my case, I'm, I'm interested in all the indiv individuals who sent or receive information uh, in the intellectual cooperation documents. This involves extracting this information, these names from each document, then cross-referencing all the appearances in a kind of large web of information. This, this kind of network analysis allows us to discover that uh, the influential people are not always the ones we think. And this goes completely uh, in the same direction as this, this new uh, historiographical movement uh, that tends to, to try to, of course, assess that uh, 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 Einstein, Bergson, Curie, and, and, and others were the, the very famous and big names in, 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 in the 
in, in the activity of intellectual cooperation, cooperation but there, there were many other people involved as well. And we see these people in these documents and the digitization makes it possible to automatize the defection of all these people and to, to be able also to assess their own uh, responsibility and, and uh, uh, engagement in, in, in this subject. Um, this kind of of approach which uh, uh, lets the data speak for itself without being conditioned by presuppositions like, like, okay, I'm an historian, I want to work on Bergson because Bergson is a very interesting person, so I will focus only on the document uh, 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 involving Bergson. The, this approach from the data and not from the hypothesis um, results in, in less focus on these hyper famous personalities and, and more on the international civil servants that are really the people that keep the organization going. And they are rarely mentioned in, in uh, the historical literature, but they are the, the ones who really do the work. And, and of course, this is obviously only one way among many use of uh, digital tools uh, on these archives. You, 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 you spoke about digital humanities, that, that's, a, that's a very big and, and, and especially large and wide research community with lots of tools, a very, very impressive toolbox that is, that is completely evolving uh, every time. So, so it's very hard today to, to predict exactly which tools will, will be used for, for which uh, use uh, uh, in these archives. But of course, we, we, we can imagine text mining and, and automatically highlighting uh, uh, um, or, or extracting the, the, the subjects of the documents to try to understand what was on the agenda, when, with which kind of people. Um, to do special analysis of the place that are mentioned in the documents to try to understand uh, also the diversity in terms of the representativity of the of the nations that were uh, member states of the league uh, can imagine a global study of the biographies etc I mean the the sky is the limit with a uh, uh, this toolbox fascinating thank you so much dr Gonjon and I'm, I'm sure we'll be back uh, on these aspects later on the during the, the q a session. And in fact, for those who haven't submitted a, a question yet, this is your last chance. Please head to menti.com and type in the code you find on the screen. But while we wait for our audience to submit their questions, we'd like to engage with our speakers. Days ago, we asked them to select one document from the archives and to talk about it today. So we, the promotion of the archives is the core of the histories series because they represent an incredible opportunity for researchers and historians to have access to documents that have, have been kept uh, in boxes for years. So now they're fully digitized and available to the public thanks to a project, five years project, Long Tud. So our speaker selected one document from the archives and let's see if they managed to comment uh, on, an, on them in less than 90 seconds. Dr. Lee, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, so I chose the minutes of the first session of the ICIC. So from my personal perspective, it's one of the first historical documents I found from the online archive system several years ago when I did my PhD pro program which brought me to the field of the study of the ICIC. So previously, when I was in Geneva in 2015, uh, I only collected the documents directly relating to the educational cooperation between China and the League. So the documents uh, and the digitalization program for me really uh, inspired my research. And I think the document still matters today. So it records the beginning of the century intellectual cooperation and the document uh, records the event of the first time the committee members of the ICIC they gathering together and it guides us to know what were the most concerned topics among intellect international intellectuals after the horrible war and the methods they taken to promote and maintain peace and the, the forming structures and the machinism of the ICIC, which is still very important for nowadays, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, it, that was amazing, less than 90 seconds. And now let's go to Dr. Gonjean. Would you like to show us the, the document you selected? Sure. Uh, um, this document is not particularly interesting for itself. It's, it's simply an annotated version of a small pamphlet of, on, on the League of Nations to, re, uh, to be republished in 1933, I think. Um, but what is very interesting is that this specific pamphlet uh, here uh, um, 
has been annotated by by an editor with a pencil and and it shows a pictorial representation of the organization uh, of the league of nations uh, and and there is there is a a, a row uh, uh, that shows that the editors uh, proposed to move the entity intellectual cooperation from the status of an advisory commission to the status of a technical organization so it it goes up in in the organization chart uh, this is a key moment for intellectual inter intellectual cooperation that's that's really a moment where we see that it it gains uh, uh, influence and 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 graphically here uh, it's moving from from a lower place to a higher place in the in the global league of nations uh, uh, organization thank you so much and now we head to professor laka Professor Laka, contrary to Dr. Lee and Dr. Grandjean, you didn't select a specific document, but an entire dossier about the Conference of International Students Organization. Can you tell us why and why it's still relevant, important today? Actually, it is a document as well. It's a, it's a report that is in that, do that dossier contains one particular re report and that's the document. Uh, and that document is uh, a report on a meeting held uh, within the framework of the League of Nations work with international intellect for intellectual cooperation with uh, the representatives of international student organizations. And these meetings between league officials, uh, the international intellectual cooperation bodies and student officials continued over subsequent years. Uh, it's very instructive for several reasons. First of all, this is just one of several meetings where protagonists of intellectual cooperation really tried to work with the leaders of different international associations, groups from civil society, in order to address particular issues. Secondly, it highlights the importance placed on youth, and in this case, university students. Uh, and within that meeting, it's a report that's over 100 pages, People discussed all matters of things about the recognition of diploma, student travel, including the project of an international student identity card that would make it easier for students to have access to discounts, uh, the economic uh, and career prospects of students. A lot of different issues are part, part of that uh, as well. So it gives us that sense of taking youth seriously and making it part of the, the, the fabric of what the League of Nations was about. And then finally, it highlights uh, also that it's not just a question of the League of Nations reaching out, but that actually uh, the League system of intellectual cooperation involved people shaping the agenda. And this is particularly striking here. I mean, it says uh, on the front of this dossier, uh, Conference of International Student uh, Associations report by Madame Bosonke. Bosonke was not a League official. Uh, Theodora Bosonke was a uh, a representative of the International Federation of University Women. So even the, the minutes for this meeting were written by someone who came from outside of the league system, which highlights some of the openness as well. And this is why intellectual cooperation was actually important, this kind of way of reaching out to different constituencies and involving them in different ways. Thank you so much, brilliant. Thanks a lot and thanks to all of you for engaging with us with this activity. Now, I'd like to hear from our audience. Um, do we have questions? Let's head to Mentimeter and see if our audience has questions for our speakers. For Dr. Lee, um, could you elaborate on the continuity between the efforts of the League of Nations and UNESCO? Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, in fact, there are many uh, con uh, the continuity between the efforts of the League of Nations and the UNESCO. Uh, just the one I mentioned, uh, the revision of uh, history textbooks. And also, I think uh, the teaching of the League of Nations programs was later transferred to the teaching of the UNESCO. So, uh, uh, no, teaching about the United Nations. So, it's also about uh, how in the after one new uh, international orders or the new uh, attempts to uh, interfere to keeping peace. So how, the, uh, how we should uh, uh, understand all the international organizations. Yeah, and I think those are the main two aspects that I focused on. And I think if we uh, go to the most uh, specific ones, then maybe I think it was uh, the 
uh, educational missions were sent to China by League of, uh, League of Nations in 1921. Uh, in 1931, and I think um, UNESCO later also did some uh, like this uh, educational assistant works to the maybe third world uh, after the war time. So this also a kind of a continuity. Thank you. I'm sure Professor Laka also would like to add a, a comment to that. Yes, and I think it's important as historians to always think about continuities and, and ruptures in the way that these international bodies uh, operated, emerged, and broadened their agendas. Um, of course, we can see a lot of continuities, even from the, the, the physical presence of UNESCO in Paris, uh, and you know some of the people who were involved in the early years of UNESCO had previously been supporters of the League of Nations activities in the realm of intellectual cooperation. But we also should be aware that there are discontinuities that in a way the, the, the kind of conception of UNESCO of its realm of activities and of society was arguably more democratic. UNESCO operates in, a, in an episode, in, in an era that is soon to be uh, shaped also by the forces of decolonization. Uh, it has the ambition of becoming a, a global actor in ways that the uh, intellectual cooperation bodies were in a much more limited, to a much more limited degree. Uh, and importantly, um, we need to acknowledge that uh, intellectual cooperation, as it was being conceived by many protagonists in the 1920s and 1930s, was uh, quite elitist. Uh, it, uh, only to a limited extent, sought to reach out to mass audiences. Uh, you know, yes, university students, professors, academics, cultural leaders, so to speak, uh, they were target audiences, but efforts really to to deal with broader popular questions. And the way that UNESCO tries to do it, uh, kind of really that, that, that emphasis on also uh, big education programs and so on is something somewhat different. So, so there are kind of certain, certain discontinuities as well. Absolutely, what a great journey from the League of Nations to UNESCO today. Uh, let's see if we have another question for our speakers. Let's go to the second one. Uh, feminist groups played quite an important role for the creation of the League of Nations. What was the role of women, individuals or associations in the field of intellectual cooperation? Dr. Grandjean, would you like to take this question? Yeah, sure. I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Danielle will also be able to, to, uh, um, to reflect on the document it shows because it, it's, it's clearly uh, a document that is, that is links, linked to this question. But um, maybe one element I can bring here is that um, uh, a, a true uh, a women were, were uh, uh, important in the field of intellectual cooperation. Within the League of Nations, it was not the section that was the m most concerned with the question of women and not the place where uh, you'll find uh, uh, most of the, of the women organizations. Uh, it would be probably more on, on, on social questions. Um, but uh, uh, one very, very instrumental uh, woman in, in uh, uh, ICIC was uh, Christine Bonvi, uh, uh, who, who was a representative uh, during the, 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 the first years of the, the Assembly of the League of Nations, and, and, and she's the, the person who, who clearly made the Assembly right in the, in the, in the uh, text uh, uh, creating the, the committee that the committee has to, con uh, to, to, to contain at least one woman uh, uh, within its members, and, and, and she was uh, then the, the first uh, woman with Marie Curie uh, in this committee. So yeah, probably Christine Bonvie, less known than, than Marie Curie, is probably the, the influential woman within uh, intellectual cooperation during the first five, six years of its activities. Thank you for your answer. Professor Laka, would you like to add something? Um, yes. So. I've, I've given the example of bodies such as the um, uh, International Federation of University Women, and I would, uh, however, also echo Martin's uh, point that when you look at some of the really important uh, ventures that provide frameworks for international women's organizations to engage with the League, it works, on, works partly through other mechanisms within the League system, uh, much, you know, to, to, to a much more significant extent. But um, having said that, in particular, when it comes to the, to the field of education, um, there are kind of connecting points. And I wonder whether kind of Kylie might also have some, some comments on that. Um, kind of, you know, associations of headmistresses, uh, for instance. Um, I think there's been some work by, 
uh, George Goodman on how, how such associations also operated, cooperated with the wider league system. So, so, th so they are connecting points. Um, and of course, within the Institute itself, there are women officials, uh, the um, individual who is one of the most senior German officials within the International Institute of Intellectual Cooperation, for instance, is a case in point. Thank you for your comments. I believe we have time for one more question. Let's see. To all the speakers, uh, what do you think is the most important outcome of the League's effort in the field of intellectual cooperation? Dr. Lee, would you like to go first? Uh, okay, so I think this question, uh, so most important outcome, mm, I think first of all, it's, uh, uh, it's it's started uh, uh, after the First World War. Uh, it, uh, no, I think first it's, uh, it continues many previous wars efforts in the field of uh, intellectual cooperation. And uh, so make it uh, like, uh, make, make those uh, previous programs continuous and also bring uh, brought new new works and fields. And many of them, they are continued after the Second, uh, after the Second World War. And I think it's had already, it's, uh, a good attempt or endeavor to uh, seek how the intellectual corporations and uh, could, pro uh, could promote the peace and uh, uh, mutual understanding and uh, promote the connection of the world. Thank you, Dr. Li. And Dr. Kongzhang, would you like to add something? Yeah, I think um, it, 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 it might be also a bit, a bit general, but in a certain way, existing is already an extremely uh, important outcome of intellectual cooperation in a certain way uh, 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 at the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the, 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 the diplomats that were there, they were, they were really not trying to, to fix anything linked to science and culture. They were really uh, thinking about the war and the recuperation and, 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 and punishing Germany and, and trying to, to have all these interests uh, um, uh, uh, work together to, 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 to build the world of, of, of tomorrow, to, to, to build the world of the, of the 20s and, and, and 30s. Um, and um, being able to put science and culture on the agenda uh, uh, from time to time at the assembly of the league at the council uh, is something that uh, that is that is yeah a, a very big outcome and of course the, the symbolic uh, uh, outcome of, the, of intellectual cooperation also also very uh, very important for the scientific world in general i mean uh, uh, of course uh, scientists in old countries they were they were not necessarily very concerned or very interested in, in intellectual cooperation globally because they were dealing with their own daily uh, daily stuff but uh, 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 to, to be able to show that uh, some 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 elite uh, uh, scientists were able to meet in the same room and to discuss uh, a very technical, precise question on, on scientific exchanges uh, uh, is already something that is that is meaningful for the society of the 1920s. Thank you for your comments and thanks to all of you for all the insightful comments uh, you shared today. I wish we had more time to discuss these topics. And it was such an incredible uh, opportunity to discuss together and to learn from, from you. So thanks again to our speakers for today's insightful session. And of course, thanks to all of you who joined the session today and who participated in the, in the activities. Now, if you want to find out more about the UN archives and resources on intellectual cooperation, there are plenty of resources you can have access to. The UN Archives Geneva platform will give you access to the archives of the League of Nations. The research guide will be, is dedicated to intellectual cooperation. And also, if you have any question, you can uh, contact us through the Ask an Archivist system. Thanks again for your participation and feel free to leave your feedback. Uh, have a very nice evening and I'll see you next time. A bientôt.